We acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional custodians of the continent, whose culture is the oldest living culture in human history. We pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and we respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. They share the memories, traditions and hopes of the traditional ancestors with the new generation today and in the future. We would also like to thank them for looking after this land for thousands of years. Good afternoon everyone and welcome back to our Earth Science Week sessions today, proudly brought to you by um, Geoscience Australia and um, hosted by myself, Karen, from Virtual Excursions Australia. So today we are joined from the fabulous Amelia from Physics Education for our Geology Rocks program. So if Amelia is asking you a question, put your responses in the chat and if you've got questions for Amelia, put them in the Q&A and we'll get to those throughout the session as, as well. So what a great way to continue Earth Science Week with our Geology Rocks program. Amelia, all the way over to you. Hello, hello everyone. Excellent. So I'm super excited to get into some Geology Rocks because personally I do think Geology Rocks. Get it? Now, as, as Karen said, my name is Amelia from a place called Physics Education. We go to lots of different schools, do lots of different kinds of science. My favorite kind of science is actually paleontology. Now, I actually really like to ask you guys questions. So if you know what paleontology is, write it down in the chat for me. I can see I've got two screens here. So it's coming up there on my other screen. Uh, I can see, yes, there's some schools from Sydney as well. Excellent. Maybe there's some people who aren't even in Sydney. Now, oh, I've got some good answers here. The study of dinosaurs and fossils. Yes, excellent. And I think you actually had a paleontology session earlier today. So that's really amazing if you guys got to see that too. Now, uh, fossils, paleontology, geology, it's all related. I actually have a whole bunch of different rocks that I want to start uh, showing you guys to look at as well. And I'll give you a few tips to keep an eye out. If you're looking at rocks yourself, honestly, when most people see a rock, they go, it's a rock. But there's a few different things you can check to see if your rocks are actually kind of interesting. Now, first, actually, let's think about there are three main types of rocks. You can kind of categorize these rocks into three main categories. If anyone knows one of these categories, put it down in the chat. I want to see who can actually tell me. Oh, I can see a couple of answers. I'm going to wait until there's a few more answers to see. OK, yep, yep. Now, the common answer that I usually hear first, and that's true right now, it's sedimentary. So sedimentary is one of the main categories of rocks. And also, I really like this kind because sedimentary is the kind of rock that you're mostly going to find a fossil in. Now, how about I'm going to switch my camera view. It's going to be like a top-down camera. There we go. So I'm going to slide over here to my other table. Hi, guys. Now, let me show you a really easy sedimentary rock, a really common one. Here we go. Beautiful. Now I can see that some of us are in Sydney, perhaps not all of us are in Sydney, but Sydney is filled with this kind of rock. Does anyone know what sort of rock this is? Now, in fact, Sydney is covered in this rock. I realized because I grew up in Sydney, if I imagine myself touching a really big rock, it feels like this one. It doesn't feel like any other sort of rock because I grew up in Sydney and it's everywhere. Let's have a look. I can see a few answers. Yes, this is absolutely sandstone okay so sydney is filled with sandstone and the sandstone from sydney is actually from the permian period so i wonder i don't know what you guys talked about earlier when you talked about paleontology but the permian period is even before the dinosaurs this is like 500 million year old rock now sometimes when we're naming sedimentary rocks we're really really obvious about the name so sandstone what do you think it's made of uh sand you'd be absolutely correct okay so this is like sand that's built up over time and can you also see these beautiful layers this is a really good example by the way we've got these really lovely layers because sedimentary rock it's sort of in the name it's it's sediment that's kind of uh, layered on top of each other like each day there's like a little tiny bit little tiny bit little tiny bit little tiny bit it keeps going like that and then it gets squished and then we end up with a rock sedimentary rock now you can also, as I'm moving it, you can kind of see glittering inside there. Those are going to be the sand grains, silica grains, lots of quartz in there as well. 
Now, sedimentary rock, I have another one over here. This one, this is like a sedimentary rock and there's like fossil bits preserved in there. Tiny, small ch chunks of shell in there as well. Now, as I said, sedimentary rock is, we really like looking at that one because you can find fossils in there. Now, not a lot in sandstone because it's all crumbly sand, but we get other sedimentary rocks like siltstone, mudstone. I bet you can guess what these ones were made of, right? Silt and mud. And you can imagine as the layers of rock form, each layer and each layer and each layer, a little fossil could sneak in there totally. And that's kind of how we get fossils over time. Now, let me go back to my main camera. And how about I'm going to check the chat as well. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. So we talked a bit about sedimentary rock and we mentioned that sandstone. Now I see a Q&A over there. How old would that rock be? Now, personally, I'm not sure if it's exactly from the Sydney Basin. Now, if it is from the Sydney Basin, the, it's estimated to be around 500 to 700 million years old. So that is before the time of the dinosaurs. Very, very, very ancient. Now, I'm thinking about those other two categories of rocks. So we have sedimentary. There's two more. So right in the Q, or not the Q&A, in the chat, if you want to tell me another category of rock. Hmm. Wonder if anyone knows. I can see a couple of answers. Aha. So someone said volcanic. And yes, I do want to talk about volcanic rocks, but they have a more special name because sometimes scientists like to give long, fancy names to things. Oh, and there is another, the, I can see lots of you are bringing up the third kind, but I actually want to talk about the volcanic rock first. Volcanic rock, also known as, oh, I can see a couple of you have said it, igneous, igneous rocks. Now I'll give you a tip to help remember these category of rocks. It's actually just in the word. So sedimentary sounds like sediment. And sediment is what you get at the bottom of lakes and rivers, like little sand, silt, and that can build up, build up, build up to make these sedimentary rocks. Now igneous is a clue in that word too. It sounds like the word ignite. So to ignite something is to like to set it on fire to make it hot. So you can remember igneous, it's like ignite, so it's hot, like volcanic rock. So igneous rocks, these are rocks that are formed through volcanic activity. Now the molten rock are like inside the earth and outside the earth. It has two different names, okay? So for example, I have this little earth model. We'll talk more about this more later, but we've got this orange layer here. There's lots of molten rock in there. It has two different names if it's in the earth versus if it's out of the earth. Does anyone actually know the difference? Hmm. Type in the chat for me, type in the chat. I really like interacting with you guys like this because it's like we're in person as well. Hmm. Oh, I can actually see people are thinking of different words that sound like ignite. I can see ignition. Okay. So excellent. It's the same sort of word root. So if you guys, because personally, I really like the origins of words. If you're interested in that, you can figure out what lots of words mean before you've even heard of it before. Okay. Yep. Yep. I can see we have got magma versus lava. So how about I'm going to slide this thing onto frame a little bit more. I've got a little volcano model inside here. That is magma, and when it comes out of the volcano, we'd call it lava. Now, igneous rocks, they can, you can get lots of different rocks because there's different things happening. Maybe it's solidified magma or it's solidified lava. You'd get kind of different rocks there. Sometimes it cools down really fast or really, really, really slow. And I'd like to show you some of my igneous rocks as well. So let's switch back over to our top-down camera. All right, Mr. Sandstone, move over. I actually have a very special shiny kind of glass-like rock or mineral, sorry. Now, I wonder if anyone can guess what this is. Funnily enough, lots of kids actually know the kind, this kind of mineral. Yep, 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 yep. I can see lots of correct answers. This is totally obsidian. Now, I wonder who here plays Minecraft? Me! I bet if you're in a classroom right now, everyone's gone. Me, I play Minecraft. Now, how do you get obsidian in Minecraft? Well, you add lava plus water. That's actually kind of how you get obsidian in real life, okay? So, in fact, let me show you one of my favorite pieces of paper over here. The geology of Minecraft. 
we have got a whole bunch of different rocks here that you can find in Minecraft. And this gives you hints on how it's actually similar to real life. The most common example is the obsidian. It's some lava that cools really, really fast. So it doesn't really have time to form really big crystals. Now I have another one over here. This is actually some quartz. Now quartz is the most abundant mineral on earth. I guarantee you've seen some quartz before. And by the way, there are lots of things that you might not think is quartz, but it is. So quartz, if it's different colors, it gets called different names. Like we've got citrine is yellow quartz. Amethyst is purple quartz. We've got rose quartz, that's pink quartz, of course. And then it goes all sorts of different colors. Now, this is a crystalline structure. So that's what we call a mineral. Oh, by the way, that reminds me, when I finish talking about this, let's talk about the difference between a rock and a mineral. Now, if it cools really slowly, that's how we get really, really big crystals. Okay. Now, because it's cooled really, really fast, it's more like a glass like texture. So it doesn't have big crystals. Now let's go back to my other camera because I want to bring up the difference between a rock and a mineral. So a mineral has like a crystalline structure and it's mostly made of the same stuff. And it's like uh, atoms and molecules arranged in a really, really perfect structure. That's what you get a mineral. And a rock is just something that's made from minerals. So a good way I like to think of it is like a chocolate chip cookie. Okay. Mm, I actually haven't had my lunch yet. So maybe I'm just being hungry. But honestly, chocolate chip cookie is like a rock. So imagine that the rock is a chocolate chip cookie. The cookie has the flour, the butter, the sugar, the big lumps of chocolate chips. So that's the that's all the minerals inside. Chocolate chips, flour, butter, sugar, those are the minerals. You can them all together and heat them up and then let them solidify you end up with a rock. So that's kind of the difference between a rock and a mineral. By the way, I do have another igneous rock to show you. So this one is actually quite a common one. I bet you guys know what this is too. And I have a really, really big version. Actually, oh, it's so big, it was really heavy. I couldn't even move it onto my screen. So instead, I'm going to flip my screen like that to show you my giant rock. Can you see it? right there anyone know what kind of rock this is hmm right in the chat uh, uh, yeah i can't lift it maybe i just have to warm, I mean, warm up my muscles a little bit let's see has anyone figured out what kind of rock it is hmm, i got some good guesses I got some good guesses i think i've probably tricked you guys a little bit because I've actually, it's actually not heavy. I was just kidding. I've warmed up my muscles now. So let's see how light this thing is. Yep, yeah, this is actually really, really, really light. So now, do you know what it is? Yep, yeah, lots of you know. It is pumice. Now I could actually float this in a big tub of water, but I don't really like to do it because this pumice is filled with little holes. The water gets inside and then it smells like stinky water. Well, I'm still hungry. You know what pumice reminds me of? It reminds me of like a crunchy bar or um, a violet crumble inside. It's filled with air. I do have a smaller pumice just here. There we go. Let me zoom up a little bit. This is another bit of pumice. And let's test the theory. Does it really float in water? Three, two, one. Yep, that totally floats. I can even see the bubbles as the air is getting pushed out by the water. And if I leave it there soaking, it might eventually sort of sink a little bit because it gets filled with water, but it definitely can float. Now, by the way, I've got some homework for you guys. You can do this homework anywhere you are. All you need is a beach. So it's summertime soon. We're probably going to go to the beach and well, it's not real homework. I'm not going to come back and check it, but really you can actually keep an eye out for your very own pumice. You can find it just on the beach, kind of where uh, the waves come up and then they deposit a whole bunch of seaweed and weird yucky stuff. You can actually find little tiny chunks of pumice. They're probably even smooth because they've been eroded and like weathered by the ocean. And then usually you can probably just take that piece of pumice home, especially if it's just a public beach. So that's an, a new task for you that you guys can try out next time you're at a beach. Find your very own pumice. Now this pumice over here, 
So I'm wondering, that I can see a question, it was how much does the pumice stone weigh? Now I don't have, I don't have a scale here, but let's try and think of it scientifically. This thing here, I've got about 800 mils of water in it. So that means it's about 800 grams. This right now, hmm, I'm just using my own arms as a scale. This actually almost weighs like less than 800 grams. I would say it's almost equal. It feels like maybe 700 to 850 grams. And considering it's a big rock, it's quite surprising. So I bet any of you, even if you're really small, even if you're only five years old, I bet you can hold it above your head. That's how light this massive chunk of pumice is. Now the way that this pumice is formed, it's ejected from a volcano like that. So volcanoes erupt in different ways. We will talk about that more towards the end. And it gets ejected and it cools really, really fast and it gets all frothy because it goes into the air and cools down in that honeycomb structure, just like, uh, just like a violet crumble or a crunchy bar. I see another question. Is obsidian hard to break? Now, how about we go to my top down view to look at the obsidian again? Now, it kind of depends. So it is strong, but it's also brittle. It's like glass. So if you have glass, like, so if you've got this round thing of glass, it actually is kind of hard to break in some ways, but if you hit it in a certain position, it can just kind of shatter easily. Now, by the way, I think we ha might have some older kids here too, like from year seven, eight, nine. If you've watched Game of Thrones, there's a thing called dragon glass that they're like harvesting in Game of Thrones. That actually is obsidian as well. Okay. So it's a similar kind of thing. So it can be sharp. It kind of like cracks like glass. And yes, I, I do know in, in Minecraft, the obsidian is very hard to break. So what I'm saying is it's strong, but if you kind of hit it in the right spot, then it can kind of great, uh, break like glass. Let's talk about the last category of rock. Hmm. So we've talked about sedimentary. We've talked about igneous. Who can tell me the last category? I did see it pop up earlier. I want to see it. I want you guys to tell me again. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Yep. 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 Metamorphic. Now metamorphic has a clue in its name for what it is as well. Metamorphic rocks are rocks that have just changed over time from some processes. So usually it means it's kind of, hmm, let's talk about food again. It's like if you left a Freddo chocolate bar in the car and it's hot day, and then you pick it up later and it's kind of all bendy. So you can get your chocolate bar and kind of bend it like that, but it doesn't snap. It doesn't melt either because it's not too hot, but you can definitely bend the whole thing. That's a lot of what metamorphic rocks do. Over time, heat, pressure, also being squished by the earth, they can change. Now, let me show you a good example of a metamorphic rock. Here we go. So often when you're looking at rocks, you want to find the layers that can help tell you if it's a sedimentary rock or not. But if you notice something about these layers, they're actually not perfectly straight. They're kind of curved and bent. Let's see them. I think that was the best example to show you. They're kind of a little bit wavy. So this gives me a hint that this was probably a sedimentary rock. And then it got slowly warped with time and pressure. Now we have, now it's a metamorphic rock. Now metamorphic rock could have been a sedimentary rock. It could have been an igneous rock. It could have even been another metamorphic rock. It's just any sort of rock that changes over time with heat or pressure. And the clue is in its name, it's like metamorphosis. So maybe you've heard that in relation to maybe a butterfly changing from a caterpillar. Metamorphosis metamorphic too easy now before we move on to a different topic let me just show you a few more of my cool rocks that we have in our collection this one here looks very very beautiful and i don't even i'm not sure if you can tell but it has these big cubic sort of crystalline structures there now i actually want to see what it looks like on my other camera so while i'm changing it can you guys type in the chat if, if you know what it is let me do a mega zoom on this. Let's have a look. It's very pretty. This is also known as fool's gold. Now someone said iron and you're pretty much right because fool, fool's gold is got iron in it, but its proper name is, oh, I almost got tricked because I could see you guys typing on the chat. Its proper name is pyrite. Okay. 
because I could see some people were saying mica, and I really like mica. Mica is almost like it's like thin paper sheet mineral. You can kind of peel it off. Now we don't have mica here today to show you. This is not mica. This is pyrite, also known as fool's gold, because back in the day, if people found this, they go, "Oh, I struck gold. I'm rich." This is not worth as much as regular gold. Let's show you another little. Thing I have in my collection. This is actually some garnet. So often when, so garnet, you may be thinking, isn't that like a beautiful gem that you would put on a ring? Absolutely. But a gem is when you cut the mineral into a shape and polish it. So often it just kind of looks like a weird rock in the ground if you're not knowing what you're looking for, right? Hang on, where's my middle of the camera? There it is. Now I want to show you my compass because I have got a couple of rocks. I've only got one actually. That's magnetic. So I want to see the difference. This one here, this is some basalt. We're gonna kind of twist it around. Now my compass is still moving a little bit, probably because I just sort of moved it, but it's not really following the rock. What if I compare it to this other rock that's also dark gray? Whoop, yeah, I think you can definitely see the difference there. This is magnetite, another kind of iron ore. Now. Basically, you guys know that Earth has its own magnetic field, right? So basically, this rock, the uh, elements inside are kind of attuned to the Earth's magnetic field. These are one of the first magnets that ancient humans discovered. So ancient humans figured out what magnetism was before we even kind of knew it, what it was scientifically. Let's see, I have a whole other little jar of pyrite here. And since I like fossils, let me show you a couple of fossils. Maybe you saw some earlier. Here is an impression of a shell there, and I've got a big one. Well, it's not too big. This is something called a brachiopod. So there used to be lots and lots of brachiopods, but they were outcompeted by bivalves. So those are the regular sort of shellfish little, little guys that you see around these days. And I also want to show you, this is actually some meteorite fragments, because I saw some people mentioning meteorite fragments. These have lots of iron on them as well. And often they have really, really rare minerals on them too, like iridium, stuff like that. Uh, and these are usually magnetic as well. Okay, phew. Those were a whole bunch of rocks that we just talked about. But, oh, that is way too close. Hang on, hang on, beep, beep, beep. That's better. Uh, let's just have a quick look at the Q&A to see if there's any questions I can answer just before we move on to our next sort of topic. Let's see, there's a few, and perhaps I'll talk more about it uh, later as well. Now, make sure if you're answering one of my questions, put it in the chat, and if you're asking a question, then put it in the Q&A. Now, I can see some people are saying, what's the rarest mineral and rock? Now, this actually depends on where you are in the Earth, or on the Earth, sorry, because uh, in Australia, will have different sort of minerals compared to America. Now, personally, I don't know the exact rarest mineral because often the rarest mineral is gonna be like something made out of a really, really rare element that you don't find on earth, okay? Uh, now that's something you guys can do some research on as well. And you can also compare it, what's rarer in Australia versus in America or other countries, um, whatever that is as well. Now, this kind of leads me on to our next sort of topic. I wanna to talk a bit about the plate tectonics. Now, when I do this pretty quick, because I think you may have already learned a bit about that too. This is my earth, and we're gonna flip it over insides. We have got some layers, this blue kind of layer. Let me zoom up just a little bit. That's the crust. Then this orangey layer that I mentioned before, that's the mantle where we have lots of magma. Then this red layer and the yellow layer combined, this forms the core. We've got the outer core made of liquidy metal, and the inner core made of solid iron. And this spinning of the liquid and solid iron is how the earth gets its magnetic field. Now, do you guys know, does hot stuff go up or down? Think about if you've seen someone boil a kettle, which way does the steam go? Definitely goes up. So it's really, really, really hot inside the middle of the earth. In fact, some parts of it are hotter than the surface of the sun. How crazy is that? So the magma near the core gets heated up so it rises up rises up towards the crust and then because it's near the crust it'll cool down so it goes back down towards the core so it gets heated up again so it goes up 
and then it cools down, so it goes down. And it keeps doing that, and you end up with these big things called convection currents. And those are what the tectonic plates are sitting on top, and how we actually get the movement of these tectonic plates. Well, let's, let's rewind. What even are tectonic plates? It's kind of like the Earth's been broken up into these big jigsaw puzzles. I have a couple over here. Well, actually, I've got a little piece of paper that can show you roughly, just like that. It's kind of rough, really rough, how the Earth's uh, tectonic plates are broken up. And we've got, let me show you the Australian plate. Here we go. So Australia is kind of in the middle of a tectonic plate. And this is a clue on how our geology can differ from some other areas because we don't have much tectonic activity. Now you get that from, we get earthquakes, stuff like volcanoes, from when the plates touch together, all right? So when these two plates crash into each other, a few things can happen. They can have so much force that they sort of push up like this. You get a landform. I bet you can guess what that is. This is a mountain. Sometimes they crash into each other and one is a bit more dense than the other. So it kind of slides underneath like that. And that's called a subduction zone. And as it's sliding, sometimes it slips, slips, slips. And this is where we get big earthquakes and also volcanic uh, buildup as well. Sometimes they kind of meet, but they just sort of slide past each other like that. Still lots of activity in there. That's called a transform boundary. And also other times they're actually not crashing into each other. They are pulling apart, making some new rock. That's called a rift valley. There are some places on Earth, because most of these places are down under the ocean, the rift valley. There are some places like near Iceland where the rift valley is on top of the land. So you can look up some pictures of that to see like really deep down into the Earth. Not all the way down to the core, of course, not like that. But it is very, very crazy to see the giant crevasse. Now, I mentioned the rock cycle because as we, if we think about it, rocks are being made and destroyed all the time. So as these rift valleys are pulling apart, we get magma, magma building up, and we get lots of bat, something called basalt, especially on the ocean floor. But then, for example, in a subduction zone, as the plate keeps going down, it'll get melted into the magma. So it's a big rock cycle. It re recycles itself. We also can think about this in terms of soil. So let's have a look at soil real quick. I'm going to go back to my other camera. I've got a bunch of sand and some rocks and stuff in there. Now we can break up soil types into this big triangle. It's called the North Coat soil types. Now you might be like, oh, why is soil even important? It's just dirt. Well, especially people like farmers and builders need to know what kind of soils you have so you don't mess up and put the wrong thing there and then your whole building will fall down or your farm won't have any crops. So we've got clay at one end, sand at one end, and silt at the other. Basically, these three things have different properties of absorbing water, and you need to combine them in different ways to get the best water absorption. So for example, clay is pretty good at holding water, but it's not good at absorbing it. So if there's lots of water in the clay already, the water will just slide on top, and you won't really be able to get the water back out, okay? Whereas sand, water is pretty decent at trickling through down the sand until it gets waterlogged. So as these rocks get destroyed as well, weathered, eroded, it becomes dirt, soil, then it can recycle itself, get compressed, turn into a sedimentary rock, then it can get weathered again, then it can become a magma, like go into magma, become an igneous rock, change over time. Yeah, so rocks can be changing for millions and millions of years, and it's all a connected cycle. Now, one way that scientists can actually sift through these rocks is by using pretty much just a sieve, something that you would find in a kitchen, but these ones are kind of special. So I'll bring this one right under. That one has the biggest holes at the top. Then if you unclip it, it's gonna go smaller and smaller and smaller. And I have a bunch. Let's see what the last one looks like. Now that is really, really tiny. Now, this is something that real scientists would use. I used some of these when I was studying to become a scientist. And this one is pretty small, but the ones I was using, they were so, so tiny, even tinier than this, that you weren't allowed to touch them because the force of just touching it gently with your finger would actually damage the holes. That's how small it was. So basically the concept is, I'll just leave the very top one off because we don't need it. You can sprinkle some sand, some dirt, 
and then you want to shake it around. Now already we can see that these giant, like, well, in comparison to the sand, these are definitely giant. Rocks have been organized, they've been sorted out. Let's remove that. Now I've got an even smaller layer. Let's keep sieving that, keep sieving, sieve, 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 sieve. And ooh, I don't know if you can tell, but I've actually, there's some treasure in there that I've spotted. There are some teeny tiny bits of pyrite. Oh, can you see that right in the middle of my hand? There we go, I got the light on it so it's sparkling beautifully. I put that in there because it honestly just feels like I've struck gold. Now we're gonna keep going further and we can definitely see how small this sand is. Now, when I was doing this, uh, I was trying to look for these little creatures called foraminifera, also known as forams. And these ones were so tiny, they were smaller than many grains of sand. So that sand is looking pretty average, like I'd see that sand at a beach. Let's keep going smaller. Oh, did we even get any sand in here? Oh, I can. Can you guys see that? That is really, really fine sand. And I do have one final layer, which was the bottom to trap it so I didn't make a big mess. And did we get any particles in here? Oh, yes. Very, very small amount. You can barely see it. Can you guys see a very, very fine dust on my finger? It's almost like flour or something. So that's how we can sieve soils. And if we want to do some science on that, we can look at the percentages of sand, silt and clay then we can figure out what kind of soil it is and the good properties as well. Now let's talk a bit more about these plate tectonics. So Australia is right in the middle. So that means we don't have that many earthquakes and volcanoes. We do have some. Most of our volcanoes are extinct though. So that means they don't erupt much. I have a few more notable plate tectonics. Now this activity here, it's actually a giant jigsaw puzzle. So if I had all the pieces, I could put it together into the earth now this one is pretty big and sometimes I, I ask people what do you think is the biggest plate on planet earth and most people pick this one because it looks giant but i'll tell you what uh, the biggest one is the earth no matter what anyone might tell you the earth is a globe it is not flat therefore the biggest plate it's kind of hard to tell if you look at this globe here the biggest plate is actually pacific plate so pretty much, this is the Pacific Ocean, it's huge. And often when we have map projections that are just, like just imagine a map that you would see normally, like as a poster, it's kind of cut off on either side because it's just a big empty ocean. So we don't really map it, but that is huge. This is actually the biggest plate. There's something called the Ring of Fire, which is pretty much around the edge of the Pacific Ocean. There are lots and lots of volcanoes. I wonder if anyone else has heard of the Ring of Fire. Some landforms that we can find. So I've got the Indian plate. Now, India is definitely part of Asia, but its plate is not connected to the rest of Asia. And do you guys know India is actually pushing up into the Asian plate? And what is it making? It's making a landform. So I want you guys to type in the chat India is like pushing up, it's actually pushing quite hard into the rest of the Asian plate and it's making a landform. What is this landform? Hmm. Let's see. I'm also looking at these other questions that some people have asked. You guys have such amazing questions. Let me answer these real quick. Are rocks more expensive if they are rare? Now, if rocks are more expensive, often it's to do with how much a human wants it, okay? Because, I mean, these rocks, have value but sometimes they have value for different reasons maybe they're really really strong and they're good for building but most of the time the expensive rocks are for pretty jewelry okay one of the most expensive ones we think of are diamonds now diamonds are the hardest mineral on earth and that's personally that's why i think diamonds are really awesome but also their worth is kind of inflated which means that people who uh, sell diamonds they're like diamonds are forever everyone wants a diamond but I mean, they're really pretty. Of course, if you want a diamond, they're absolutely gorgeous, but other gemstones are really amazing as well. Don't forget about rubies and sapphires. They are very, very hard as well. Not as hard as a diamond, but they are very pretty. And this is what I mean by the, like the expensiveness of a certain gem or a rock. It's up to the humans. They kind of decide that. Usually if it's more rare, it is going to be more expensive. 
Another question was, how do scientists know what is in the middle of the earth? Really good question, because no one's like dug a hole deep enough for that, okay? Now we do lots of lots of radar to see what's at the bottom. Now I'm just checking the answer. Oh, yep, a few of you are correct. The Himalayas, Mount Everest, okay? So that's what the Indian plate is doing. Now I'm just checking the time. Oh, I've talked so much about geology. Don't worry, I want to show you a few more things before we finish up. Uh, you can actually find videos and time lapses because tectonic plates, the continents have changed shape over millions and millions of years. Back in the time of the dinosaurs, so at the beginning of the time of the dinosaurs, all the continents were connected together in a giant landmass called Pangaea. All right, that's another clue. Pan means all. Okay, so Pangaea, it's all the continents stuck together. And over a hundred or so million years, they broke up into two main ones. We've got Gondwana at the south, we've got Laurasia at the north. Gondwana includes Australia, Antarctica, Africa, South America, and India, Madagascar. And Laurasia is the rest. So mainly North America, Asia, Europe, stuff like that. And then over millions and millions of years, because they're kind of floating on top of these convection currents, the tectonic plates moved around, and now we have the shape of the countries and the continents that we've got today. I wonder what it will look like in millions of years. Because we can measure the rate of how fast these move, you can totally find videos of what scientists will predict uh, that continents will look like in millions of years. That's something else you guys can look at later for some more research. Most of the tectonic plates are moving at the same rate that your fingernails grow. So every time you trim your fingernails, you can think, oh, hey, Australia has also moved roughly that rate. Now, before we finish up, I just want to talk a bit more about volcanoes. All right. Now, volcanoes. We've got two main volcanoes. We have a stratovolcano and a shield volcano. Now, the volcanoes are mainly to do with the viscosity of lava. So remember, the lava is what the molten rock is called when it's outside of the earth. When I say viscosity, that means the thickness of a liquid. So if you pour yourself a cup of honey, it's very, very viscous. If you pour yourself a cup of juice, it's not viscous. You can kind of imagine. Now, these are just some oil tubes of different vis viscosity. Enough. If I flip them, can we see there are actually some balls going down and they're going at different rates. So the slowest one is the most viscous. Now, when we have a really, uh, we have a not viscous volcano, so it's thin and runny, that's called a shield volcano. We get these volcanoes, they're quite common around Hawaii. So often the lava is coming up and it's just bubbling and spilling and it's kind of flowing out really far to make these really kind of uh, not very steep volcanoes, but they're really, really big. Now, these ones aren't super dangerous because humans are like, okay, let's just not go near that volcano because we know it's erupting. The more dangerous ones are the stratovolcanoes. These are the explosive ones. Famous ones include Mount Fuji in Japan or Mount Vesuvius. That one erupted and destroyed the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum. Maybe if you know about ancient history, you've learned about that as well. There's also Mount St. Helens in North America that uh, erupted too. Now these stratovolcanoes, they are explosive because the lava is very viscous, it's all thick. So the pressure kind of builds up, builds up until the mountain can't handle it anymore. And then you get an eruption. Now people actually like to live near these volcanoes because it kind of the rock cycle is happening quite fast there, which means the soils get lots of nutrients added and it's really good to grow crops around there. So that's why people still settle near these dangerous volcanoes. Let's just erupt a few volcanoes with some chemistry just for fun at the end. Now, I bet some of you have actually done this experiment before. Really popular experiment to erupt a volcano. We're going to use chemistry. We're going to use some vinegar and a powder as well bicarbonate of soda. Now this volcano model I have, let me get my keyboard out of the way so I don't destroy it with lava. This one is actually a 3D printed model of Mount Vesuvius. So you can actually, these days it's not too hard, you can download data from Google Maps or something like that, like Google Earth, and you can 3D print your own stuff if you have access to that technology. Now I'll give you a tip, if you are erupting a volcano, I've got some vinegar at the bottom, and red food colouring, of course, to make it look like lava. But add a bit of soap in there too. That'll help your volcano be extra bubbly. Now, I really like making it look as realistic as possible. So I'm going to add some more red food colouring to increase the intensity of the lava. 
I've got the bicarb soda here just with a bit of water to make it runny. And then I'm going to zoom up a little bit and we're going to see if we can get an eruption. Now, even though Mount Vesuvius was a stratovolcano, this eruption is more similar to a shield volcano, okay? So it's going to be more thin and runny. But kind of imagine that you're a human and you're like, oh, that's way too big. If this is a volcano, you're like the size of a grain of rice next to this. Try and imagine uh, what this would look like to you. Are we ready? Three, two, one. Oh, yeah, that is definitely an eruption. So we can see that I can, I actually saw in the chat in the Q&A, people were saying pyroclastic flow. What an amazing term. That's the name for, it's like superheated gas as well as some lava and um, dust as well. And it is, you can't outrun it. You can't outdrive it. It goes at thousands or hundreds of kilometers an hour. And that can really get you. Now, I know we are almost finished. I want to do one last experiment. I definitely want to try and model a stratovolcano using one of these things. This is a film canister. Now, back in the olden days, you used to have to go to a camera shop to get your photos developed from film. Now, these days, we mostly just use film canisters for science experiments. Basically, they're a really good shape for this sort of volcano. What I'm doing now is I'm putting bicarb in the lid and I add a little bit of water so it's kind of gooey, like a paste, so it doesn't fall out. And since I'm in a VC room, I've got like lights up there. I have seen these things fly as high as a gum tree. Okay, so really, really tall. I don't want to destroy all my lights. So instead, I'm going to try and trap it in this cup. But there's been times where I've missed. So I wonder if it's going to hit the roof today. There's also been other times when the eruption isn't so exciting. So let's just be prepared for that eventuality as well. Let's see if I can get a volcanic eruption, a strato volcano today. Let me actually change the camera. Oh, not too far, not too far. That should do since I'm going to try and trap it as well. All right, are you ready? Oh, Whew. I hope you guys could see the violence of that force made me drop the whole cup. And that one happened so fast, I didn't have time to prepare, and it shocked me a little bit. Okay, guys, we've pretty much reached the end. Let me just double check if there are any exciting questions in the chat. So I can see a question saying, would uh, Zealandia be on the Australian plate? Now, there was an ancient continent where Australia, New Zealand, so they used to be attached. Now, we might not be able to see. Can you see poor old New Zealand? It's literally chopped in half by a tectonic boundary, okay? And if you think about countries in the news, they get lots of earthquakes. New Zealand is one of them. New Zealand absolutely gets tons of earthquakes. Another one that gets lots of earthquakes is Japan. And Japan is down here, right next to tectonic plate boundary. So if you're near these plate boundaries, this is where you're going to get lots of tectonic activity. Uh, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Um... Now guys, you had some amazing questions as well. Thank you so much for participating in the Geology Rocks session. Now, Karen, we have a couple more minutes. Did you want to stick around or are we going to move on to something else? I think we had a couple of questions about magnetic rocks. Oh, uh, yes. Um, okay, so they are basically and you're curious on how these rocks are magnetic. And honestly, magnetism is quite a complex topic. Now, basically, because this magnetite, let me show it on screen. This magnetite has iron in it, and iron is an element. Now, that, my Australian accent, there's two different words here. Iron, like iron, like the metal, and then ion, like electro electricity, okay? So we've got iron, if I was American, I'd say it like that, and ion. Iron and iron. The ions on the iron... The way that they are arranged, it kind of, because these ions are electrically charged, they kind of align themselves with the Earth's magnetic field, and that's how it becomes magnetic. But it is quite a tricky topic. Now, just speaking on that, because of this property of certain rocks, magnetism, we've actually discovered that the Earth's magnetic field has flipped over time. So right now we have the North Pole and the South Pole, but uh, thousands of years ago, they were actually opposite. 
Now, this is something that could cause a lot of problems with our electronics if it were to happen again. But scientists, we don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, but it's recorded in rocks. Very interesting. And I think we are almost out of time, but one of the questions was, what's your favourite rock? And I think that's... What's my favourite rock? Oh, an amazing question. Now, because I like paleontology, I like most rocks that have fossils in them. But I also really like a rock called opal. Okay. Now, opal... Australia actually has lots of opal. Australia has really, really beautiful opal, something called fire opal as well. And I think, for some reason, I'm thinking that opal is also my birthstone. Okay, so maybe you can figure out my birthday just from that. But opal, the other cool thing is that it glows with UV light. And uh, because fossils are made from replacement with minerals, you can actually find opalized fossils. So that means you can find a T-Rex tooth made out of opal. And I think that's really, really amazing. That's really exciting. Um, that is so wonderful that you were able to join us and share so much of that knowledge and all of those experiments as well. We had someone asking, can they put little bits of rock in their volcanic eruption? I've certainly Absolutely. done it and it's worked really well. Thank <laughs> uh, you so much, Karen. Excellent. So I'm just typing one last question out and I'm having problems. No having, uh, probably apologies to Morissette. Um, Let's see, someone asked, what about stromatolites? Now, those are formed in caves and that's formed from dripping water and it's pulling on limestone as well. Speaking of limestone, uh, that's a sedimentary rock, but it can turn into marble over time from meta it become a metamorphic rock. And this kind of means, because limestone has fossils in it, there's a very rare chance that you can see tiny fossils in your marble countertop if you're lucky. Oh. Very exciting. Um, so one of the things is is to keep an eye out and look. Someone was asking where the um, rocks have come from. Sometimes you're just collecting them, you're finding them, a nice, interesting piece of rock. Certainly from my collection that I have here, some of the things I buy if I want a special rock to show an example, and especially if I'm buying some fossils as well. So um, you can certainly purchase them from a lot of the education suppliers, little rock collections like from Modern Teaching Aids um, and some of the National Geographic um, kits. They often sell rocks and minerals and fossils as well. So there are places you can get them, but sometimes just walk outside, have an explore, see what you can find. Um, excellent. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And a big thanks to Amelia from Physics Education and, of course, Geoscience Australia for supporting this whole program today. So thank you very much, everyone, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye, guys. Thank you.